else in the story that we often miss. And I'm not going to go through the whole story because it's, I only have a, a short time, but I just want to bring this point out at the beginning. In verse 6, it says, At midnight, the cry rang out. Here, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. At midnight, a cry rang out. Who cried? <laughs> Who cried? The watchman. The watchman. Of course, you could say it's the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit often cries through the watchman. Come so. on. That's right. <laughs> I don't want to just be someone who has oil in my lamp. I want to be someone who's so aware of what's happening in the Come kingdom. On. Come on. <laughs> that I'm one who knows that the bridegroom is coming and I'm crying out to the church and crying out to the world. Awaken. Awaken, the bridegroom's coming, awaken, he's nearly here, awaken. And um, if you're trying to awaken someone, and it's an, it's an emergency, then you don't just be like, awaken, <laughs> awaken, awaken. You scream it out. Come on. And as I was singing before, I want to be an awakening bell, and I don't want to be a tiny little bell. I want to be a loud bell. <laughs> awakening bell that awakens the bride to the coming of the king and often we talk about a message or a prophecy or um, a sound and I don't want to just have something I don't want to just have a word I want to be the word I want to be the well I want to be the key and there's a shift where we need to embody what we're carrying and, and release it to the world And as we come together, all of us, as individual awakening bells, then there comes this corporate sound come on. that's louder than, than the sum of the parts. That's right. <laughs> that awakens the world to something. Yeah. And I, I want to call us back to that this morning. Um, part of what I'm talking about is the corporate and particularly about family. I hope I get through it. <laughs> um, but all of this that I'm talking about has has been part of my story, and particularly part of my story in coming to Hernhut. The Lord gave me two scriptures before I came, and at that point I didn't really know anything about House of Prayer. And the first scripture was Genesis 26, about redigging the wells, and the second scripture was Jeremiah 6:16 6, about following the ancient paths, and I had no clue what they meant. And the Lord gave them me, and I wrote them down, and I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> and then... The story is a long story and you can come and talk to me, but those scriptures have been very much part of my experience here. Um, and more recently, particularly about the ancient paths. Um, and that's the, the part I want to focus on this morning. So I want us to turn to Jeremiah 6.16. says this is what the Lord says stand at the crossroads and look ask for the ancient paths ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls <laughs> and these these words are very active words we think of standing and waiting as inactive but as watchmen it's very active word stand I might probably get it, I'll probably completely butcher the Hebrew but it's amad and it means to, it means to stand to stop in, in your place in your tracks and to consider something to stand and to look and this is what the scripture is saying stand and look, stop take note, take account stop your busyness come to stillness and then the, the, it talks about the ancient past. Ask for the ancient past. So you're standing, you're looking, and you're saying, where is the ancient path? And the ancient path is olam, the word, and it means timeless and eternal. We're looking for eternal truths. We're looking for eternal principles. We're looking for eternal ways right. so Come that on. we can walk in them. 
and then you will find rest for your souls. A few chapters later in Jeremiah 18, 15, it talks about how we've exchanged the ancient paths for byways. And we've stumbled because of that. It says, Yet my people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless idols, which have made them stumble in their ways and in the ancient paths. They made them walk in byways and on roads not built up. What's the difference between a highway and a byway? A highway is clear. <laughs> You can go fast. And it's like we were, when we become believers, we're, we're, we become a Ferrari. And we're designed to go down the highway very fast. <laughs> Come on. But when we forsake the Lord's ways, we have, when we go on the byways, it's like trying to drive a Ferrari through a, through a jungle. You can't do it. You can't do it. And so we've, we've forsaken these ancient paths and we try to, to walk in the byways and... And the whole world is doing this. And what that means is that we have to struggle and strive and struggle and strive just to survive. We have to find our way through the byway that we were never supposed to be walking on. And isn't that that what it's like for society? Society's restless. Society's stressed. Society's fighting just to to be okay, just to, to be alive, just to function, not even... Not even uh, enjoy life, but just get by. So many people are stressed and so many people have mental health difficulties. Struggling in their life. And we're on the wrong path. I want to share with you a picture, an analogy that really helped me with this. Um, It's from a man called Craig Hill. He wrote a book called Ancient Paths. And he, in it, he describes um, uh, yeah, a situation. So in an, in an ancient, uh, if, if we wanted to build an ancient city, one of the first things you would do, um, probably after digging a well and finding some water, is build a wall. So the cities always had a wall around them. Um, and that was to protect the city, to keep the bad things out and keep the good things in. Um, and so that's what would happen first. And, by, if you don't have a wall, then every person needs to be a warrior because you never know when the enemy is going to come in. But once you have a wall, then, you, then we can have a few people who are warriors and everyone else can get on with what they're supposed to be doing, whatever their job is, whatever their calling is. But without the wall, we tr- we're trying to struggle between being a warrior and being whatever else we're supposed to be doing. And we all have to be on alert constantly. And that's what it's like for society. Um, and so there's this story of this, this city with a wall. And uh, everybody's happy in their life within the city walls. Until one day one man realizes that there's some really good fish outside of the wall. That if only he could catch those fish and sell those fish, then he would make a lot of money. But he knows he can't go there in the day because everybody would see what he's doing. Um, and so he decides, okay, I'll go, I'll go at night, but I can't get out because the city gates are closed at night. So I'll dig a hole. So he digs a hole in the wall. He breaks the wall, just a little hole. No one will notice. So he breaks the wall and goes out and catches the fish um, and begins to, to sell them in the day. You know, he can go out there and sell them wherever he wants and he starts making a lot of money. And he's feeling very good about himself. And then... Um, a little while later, somebody kind of catches on. Hey, he's getting a bit rich. What's going on here? And he kind of watches him and sees what he's doing. And then this person also thinks, hey, this is a good idea. I could do something similar. There's some great fruit out there that we don't have in here, and I, I can go and get it. So he digs a hole somewhere else, and he starts doing it. And then bit by bit, people start getting greedy for something that's outside of the city, and they start to dig a hole and break the wall down. And then after a while, the walls are so broken down that the enemy realizes, aha, I can get in. I can get in. So he starts coming in, whoever that enemy is, and stealing things. Um, And gradually the whole thing just crumbles down. And then everybody is back to being a warrior. 
because the enemy is, is the enemy going to come? Is the enemy going to come today? There's nobody watching the wars. There's nobody. There's no wars. Um, and I think it's obvious what the analogy is that we have God-given principles that are supposed to protect us and keep us on the right path. And yet, because of greed or because of you know, selfishness or because of sin, we wanted something outside of those walls. And then the walls start to break down. The walls start to break down. And sooner or later, we're in this fight that we can't just live as the way the Lord intended us to because we have to watch our back the whole time. And we don't even know how to live properly anymore. We don't even know what the wall looks like. We don't even know what the principles are. And so we're just trying to survive along with the rest of the world. We need to put those walls back. We need to seek those walls, seek those ancient paths and rebuild uh, the wall. But the thing is, you know, building a wall can sometimes take a long time. And making the choice to forsake the riches, the riches <laughs> that were outside, takes a corporate decision. It can't just be one person. It has to be everybody choosing to, redig the wall, uh, to um, rebuild the wall. And he was saying in this book that an internal perspective helps us to choose as this generation to be the generation that rebuilds the wall even though we may not see the benefit in this in our lifetime and that is the challenge for the wall builders because we like instant we want to see fruit we want to be gratified That's right. But the question is, will we be the generation that will rebuild the wall and choose to, for a season, look like we've lost? Look like we've lost by rebuilding the wall for the next generation. A selfless task for kingdom's sake. And that's what we read in, in Hebrews about the men of faith who, who served the Lord even though they knew they wouldn't see the fulfillment in their lifetime. That's who we need to be. And that's what a kingdom perspective does. It says, I'm, I will pray. I will build. I will uh, change and turn for the sake of, of the next generation, for the sake of the world. And I want to give you uh, four ancient paths that help to re rebuild that wall. The first... Uh, ancient path comes from the scripture I mentioned before, Genesis 26. The redigging of the wells. This is the ancient path of honour and generational honour. I'm not going to go through the whole story because we don't have time, but um, just picking up in uh, verse 18, so Genesis 26, verse 18. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped, stopped up after Abraham died. And he gave him the same names his father had given them. And then it talks about them redigging, digging new wells. And there's a couple of wells that were quarreled over. And then it says, he moved on from there and dug another well. This is verse 22. And no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. And I want to pick up a, a, something that I think is a biblical principle here. It's interesting to note that first, before he dug a new well, he reopened the old wells, and he gave them the same name that his father had given them. And this is a principle of honour, of honouring what's gone before, both honouring what the Lord's done, but also honouring the fathers and mothers who've dug before us, who've gone before us, because we recognise that we stand on their shoulders, and we go in the flow of what they've already uh, laboured for. Amen. 
And then as we honour, as we, as we respect, as we say yes to what the Lord did and say yes to those people who faithfully served, then we gain the authority to dig a new well. And the Lord will give us room. The Lord will give us room. And I just want to bring that out as a principle of community, that we recognise the work of, of um, our ancestors and of the generations. We need to learn that, to, to look to the fathers and mothers and say thank you. Thank you for what you did. But those that are still alive in our generation, to, to honour them, to respect them. Not to just be like, okay, I'm doing my new thing because you're, you know, your thing's old. But to respect what they carried, how they faithfully served. And then, the, then you gain the authority to dig a new well. It's the principle of honour and of generational authority. The second um, ancient path is the principle of Shabbat. Genesis 2.3 says, And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all work of create, creating that he had done. Shabbat, the only day that was blessed and made holy. You know, we often think about Shabbat as we've worked and now we can have a rest. And that it's good for us, so it's a gift, right? It's a gift and it's good for us, and we get that as a a good principle that will just refresh us. Yes, of course, it is that, but it's far more than that. Shabbat is a weapon. Shabbat is a weapon against what the world is saying. Shabbat is a weapon against uh, the principles of Egypt, that say you have to work and 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 and you have to do it in your own strength and you have to keep going and producing more and producing more because that's the only way that you will succeed. And Shabbat says no. There is a God who is a father and we can trust him. We are not in control. We do not need to strive. We can choose Shabbat. And not only for our own good, but we're we're sending a message to the world that there's something greater than our own achievements and our own successes. Amen. It reminds us. It's a remembrance. It's a celebration. It's a family thing. We often think of it as, okay, so we'll have Shabbat, which means I can lie in bed all day or whatever, something like that. But actually Shabbat should be a family time time of rejoicing and celebrating and worshipping together, a time of looking into each other's lives and seeing kingdom things and calling them out. Shabbat is about um, thinking of eternal things, reminding us of eternal things, because all week we're, we're, we're stuck in the very temporal, we're doing our work, we're, we're doing the things we need to do and filling in forms or whatever it is we do, we're doing the temporal things, we're doing the earthly things, and Shabbat is is what makes us realize, hey, there's something beyond this, there's something eternal that we're working towards, that we're, we're living for. And it takes us out of space into time <laughs> and reminds us of eternal God and of kingdom things. It doesn't just change us individually, but it changes our homes, it changes our families, it changes our communities when we choose to make the hard decision. Because it is a hard decision. Everybody has a a good reason why it's not possible in their life to do Shabbat. But I want to challenge you and encourage you to look into it. Not as a, I have to do this. as As a religious thing or a legalistic thing. But as a principle, a holy way, an ancient path, a gift from the Lord. That not only will do us good but will be a message to the world about what kind of God we serve. The one who's so confident he can rest. And he wants us to be that confident in him. 
So the principle of honor, the principle of Shabbat. The third thing is the principle of covenant. There's absolutely no time to really go into this. But just to say, we really need to understand again what covenant means. We have a covenant keeping God. We have a God of covenant love. Covenant is at the foundation of what he's done and said and what he is doing and what he is saying. And we need to learn about that, what covenant relationship looks like. We're already in covenant. We just have to agree with him on how to walk it out with him and with one another. And this is really important for the watchman. Um, it was really helpful to me when I first uh, read Tom Hess's book about being, being a, a watchman. Because he talks about how um, anyone can be a watchman at, di- at different levels. So even a, a nine-year-old boy can be a watchman over his own soul. And that's where it starts. It starts with us watching over our own lives and making sure we're in alignment with the Lord. That's right. And as we, as we gain understanding there and as we're faithful in that place, then we, we get to learn and we have the authority in, in other arenas. And God, God wants to learn to be watchmen in our homes, watchmen in our families, and watchmen in our cities and watchmen in our nations. But it starts way back, watchmen of our own soul. And often we get that all middle, muddled up. We want to be watchmen over the nations. And yet our homes and our families are in a mess. Or our personal walk with the Lord is in a mess. And we have to get these things in the right order. We need to learn what it means to steward our relationships. Covenant with other people will keep us on the wall when it's not fun anymore. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Ooh, say that again, Stu. That's so good. (laughs) Covenant is what will keep us on the wall when it's not fun anymore. Come on. We need those covenant relationships. We can't do this alone. And it's not just a case of saying, I'm a watchman, you're a watchman, let's do our watchman thing. It's about actually making commitments to one another and standing together through the hard times, through the easy times. That's right. Through the fun times, through the not so fun times, saying, I'm covenanting to you. Because yeah. Yeah. this is not just about, you know, the sunny days. <laughs> this is about that's every right. day. And that's the God we serve, a covenant God. That's right. We need to steward our, our relationships. We need, like Daniel, um, Daniel was saying, <clears throat> we need Elisha's. We need Jonathan's. We need to be those people. Before we ask for one ourselves, let's learn to be one ourselves. Let's learn to be an Elisha. Let's learn to be a Jonathan. That's what the Moravians did. They were all about relationship. They were all about covenants. Standing together, worshipping together, going through the hard things together. And that's what we need to learn again. That's what will, will sustain um, a move of the Lord is when we steward it in, 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 in community. When, we're, when our relationships are right, we're in alignment with the Lord. And then the last, the last uh, point is... The way of a blessing in family or the way of family. And this is the one that's been burning in my heart in the last few months. Because the church has spoken so much about the individual walk with the Lord, which is obviously where it all starts. But then we've jumped right over to the corporate and we've missed out family. We need to learn what it means to build the altar of worship and prayer in our homes. The wall of the family is completely broken down. 
And how is the world supposed to know what it's supposed to look like if the church is not doing it? We're portraying to them exactly the same picture that they have all around them. And we've built up pastors and teachers and leaders who don't know how to father their sons and daughters. Their own sons and daughters. They're so busy doing the work of the church that they're not discipling their own children. It has to change. We have to go back to the ancient path of family. We need to rally around the family and and help them to be all they were created to be. Ministry isn't about outside the family. Ministry first, discipleship first, is in the family home. And we need to train and support fathers in being fathers and mothers in being mothers. We need to pour our resources towards the family, not towards every project and whatever that is out there because what's happening then is is we see the mess in family and we see this broken lives and there's problems and issues so we we set up a program over here to compensate for what's not happening in the family and then we just keep compensating 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 we need to get back to the root and start living out the picture of family that god intended In Genesis 2.15, it says, The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it, to tend and to keep it. Part of the meaning of that word is to guard, to guard the garden. That was, that was the man's role to guard the garden. We, we often think about, so Eve ate the apple. But why was the enemy even in the garden? Because the man should have been guarding the garden. What was he doing when the enemy came in? Fathers are called to guard their homes and families. Right. To make sure there's no sign of the enemy in their home. It's the the role of the father to say, no, I will not have pornography in my home. No, I will not have this sin or that sin. He needs to guard the house and guard the family, watch over it, and not let even a trace of the enemy into that place. And we're preaching it out there, but we're not doing it in our homes. We need to help fathers. This is not to criticize anyone. It's to say, let's get things back into alignment. Let's build the wall around Amen. the family. Let's, let's build the altar of prayer in the home. Let's pour our resources into training and teaching mothers and fathers to disciple their own children. Never mind everybody else's. And as we do that, that's where we gain authority then to watch over cities and nations. One of the ancient paths in family that I think we need to recover is the is the um, the path of blessing, the way of blessing. You see it all through the Bible. The fathers and mothers spout, spoke out blessing, yeah. identity and destiny over their children. And I haven't got time to go into it, but at key points in in a child's life, in, into adulthood, there were points where this is the point where blessing, identity and destiny should be spoken. Right from naming to marriage <laughs> into old age, there's these, these points, appointed times when fathers and mothers were to speak out blessing and destiny. And we've lost that ancient path. We've lost that ancient way. And so we have children who have no idea who they are. And if we don't tell them their identity, someone else will. The world will be happy to tell them who they should be, who they are. We need to recover that ancient path. Just think about it, right from naming. Hebrew children, they were, their name meant something. 
And every time it was spoken out, it was like a declaration of identity and destiny. This is who you are. This is who you were created to be. And we've become so individualized that we don't want to tell anybody who they should be. You know, They have to find out for themselves. But if God gives you a word for your ch- child about who they should be supposed to be, then you are the, age, uh, the, a- the agent to declare that. He makes parents the agent to declare yeah. destiny yeah. and That's identity. Right. Yeah. That's his God-given order. If you're not doing it, someone else will. We need to declare destiny and identity over and over again over our children so they grow up into who they were created to be. And I heard this this, this story of um, a young girl who wasn't a believer and she went round to um, to her friend's house who, who was Jewish, not Messianic, but just Jewish, and uh, and they were going to go out and play, and the father just came, and he just put his hand on his daughter and on this friend, and he just blessed them. He just spoke out blessing over them, and this had such a deep impact on this girl. Of like, wow, it did something in her heart. And it was simple, but it was profound. And imagine that if, if, if day by day, fathers and mothers are just speaking out blessings, speaking out identity, speaking out destiny over their children, how much the family home will change. We need to recover that ancient path. We need to learn the way of blessing. So I want to encourage you to think about those things for your own life. The principle of honor and generational authority. The principle of Shabbat where we corporately stand against the world's systems and trust the Lord. The principle of covenant, where we steward the relationships that the Lord has given us. And the principle of family and blessing, so that we bring back into order uh, our lives, our homes, our families, for the glory of the Lord, because then the world will see what it's supposed to look like. In Genesis, God, most of those scriptures are from Genesis, and God, in Genesis, God painted a picture of the way it was supposed to be. And throughout the Bible, he's declaring that we are the ones who are supposed to be declaring the picture of him to the world. And yet, we're displaying a broken picture. And the Lord is calling us to restore that picture and to start in our own homes. And then show the world what what our Father is really like, what His kingdom is really like, what His love is really like. Amen. 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 Amen.